Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. This is going to be episode 125 with Steve McGarry. He is the founder and CEO of Sandstorm, a platform that connects brands with designers who help them to enter the metaverse. I've chosen to talk to Steve because companies are spending billions of dollars on the metaverse, even though as a still nascent industry, we're still trying to figure out what it's going to actually be like in the future with companies like Meta, formerly Facebook, committing to spending billions a year alone on making their vision come to fruition. Sandstrom's marketplace is generating seven figures a year, which shows that not only is there money willing to be invested by uh, VCs into the metaverse, despite the current market conditions, but there's also hard cash being spent by brands on marketing, PR, and uh, designs that will help them to get into the metaverse and interact with uh, the people that are buying their products now and into the future. So I think that's something really worth discussing, and that's why we're here today with Steve. So I hope you enjoy this interview, and Steve, why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and how you got into Sandstorm to begin with, and we'll go from there. Thanks so much for having me on, Sean, and a uh, quick background about myself. Uh, I really got into the crypto, what's now, I guess, considered Web3 back in 2013, and I was out of college. I got a corporate job and had quit the corporate job to go to a program in the Harvard iLab and got really inspired by uh, a sign that was a, a Bitcoin sign that was like this wizard that was magic internet money in Cambridge. Um, and we were sleeping on the floor in Dogpatch Labs in Kendall Square and kind of leeching off of the free food at MIT Sloan and just trying to kind of learn the, the whole startup scene in 2013 and went to a couple meetups there around MIT about Bitcoin and everything and really fell in love with it because I'd majored in economics and understood what was potentially going to transpire when you have like a actual fixed supply of something that people could store value in. And I had never really played around with it too much. So uh, at the peak, fast forwarding to today, we actually played games of ping pong that were worth probably $100,000 at this point back then. And we were just joking around, playing around a lot, tinkering around with Dogecoin and stuff like that when it first came out. And that led me to start a company called LendLayer in 2014 with a couple of co-founders. We went to California from Boston and you know raised a couple million dollars in Mountain View while there were four of us living in a tiny little two bedroom uh, apartment. And uh, it was a really great concept around peer to peer lending. And it was inspired by a lot of the you know, core of crypto, I'd like to think, where it was connecting these very high net worth individuals who could release capital as loans to students that were going to learn programming through coding boot camps. And these coding boot camps were like 12 week long programs where kids could learn how to code and get jobs. So really low risk profile. And we moved up to the city. Uh, we were kind of part of the tech problem in San Francisco back then where you'd apply for an apartment and they were like, oh, there's 20 people ahead of you. They have all the right prerequisites. They have all the people that they need to uh, you know, sign off of them. And us as a startup, we needed a place to live. We said, we just raised money. Here's the whole year of rent up front. And the landlords say, all right, skip the line. All the other people out of the way, you come on in. So that happened every day in San Francisco uh, back then where people that had just raised all this money needed a place to live in the city. And it was just such a problem for the city. And I won't go into that too much, but got a place to live there. And shortly after, we'd seen this sort of explosive growth with coding boot camps in the city and expanding into the Midwest, Southeast, and into the, you know, overseas, all over the world, basically. And we got acquired in 2015 by Max Levchin's company, Affirm. They just went public, I think, last year or something like that. Uh, and I was there for about six, three, six months, something like that. I forgot how, how long it was. And really learned the intricacies of running a very large organization like that and left that to start a company called Grow Your Base that was a uh, became the seventh largest landowner in Sandbox Metaverse um, in 2020. 
And then last year I started Sandstorm and raised a round 2.5 million from uh, about a handful of well-known VCs in the space. And we're connecting brands with thousands of metaverse builders to bring people in to the metaverse. That's kind of where we're at. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate it. As you were talking about your story, I just started going, oh yeah, I've got question, question, question. Okay, great. I've got like a bunch of questions now. The one most relevant to what you just said was, why would Web2 brands want to build for the metaverse and spend millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars getting there? Off the back of this pandemic that we all got experience, uh, you know, pretty quickly working remotely or just communicating with relatives if you don't work remotely, um, everything got pushed. It was just a shove into this virtual uh, experience where if you're on Zoom or how we're talking to each other right now, there became this question where it became a little bit more prevalent in the virtual world of talking to each other. And people were kind of challenging these young people who were in Minecraft all day and Roblox all day. But the question that was posed to a lot of people was, what makes this shirt valuable that I'm wearing on Zoom? And what makes it more valuable than one that I would buy and wear on my avatar in Minecraft or Roblox or one of those? Like, what is the difference? It's self-expression. It's me sitting here talking to you. And, you know, we can do that in an avatar setting in a virtual experience. And I can actually wear way cooler things <laughs> and look like a, you know, however I want to look and, and, and change it around in all these different cool self-expressed ways. So brands have, you know, they're savvy. They picked up on, on this pretty quickly that self-expression and fashion uh, were at the forefront of this. So last year you saw a lot of big name companies like your Gucci's and these household uh, kind of fashion brands coming into things like Roblox and these, these virtual worlds where they said, we're going to test the waters. We know Gen Z and Gen Alpha are spending eight, nine hours a day with their friends on all these different platforms, which is just to, to all the other generations that are listening to this, they might say like, that's insane, but it's just this hyper connectivity that is coming and listen to the young people, listen to what they're doing, where their friends are, where they're transacting, where they're, you know, expressing themselves and the brands are trying to get at the forefront of that. So they're, they're watching the wave come and they're all trying to get positioned for the mega wave of all these people that are doing self-expression. They're all really in these unique environments together, exploring it because it's a very exploratory phase. And there's a lot of excitement around the brands that are involved early in that, just like the first websites, you know, everybody was excited to go to pets.com and they were excited to go to all these clunky old nineties websites, very similarly in these virtual environments is kind of how I would frame the, the way that brands, very savvy brands are getting in right now. Um, cause they want to get in, in advance before the sort of young people bring in all the rest of the, the other generations. I'm a big proponent of virtual reality. I have a uh, quest two. I've had one for, uh, for over a year now, love it. Use it all the time for not work, not productivity, but for sociability, playing games like ping pong and mini golf and you name it, these kinds of things. Right. And one of the biggest problems to the growth of the VR industry is that it costs too much for people to buy the devices. They are not educated on them yet there it's just it's not there yet right metaverse is is similar in that regard although i think the metaverse will take longer than vr i, I maybe it's potential it's potentially that vr is a stepping stone to making the metaverse happen we can have that conversation later uh so basically my my question is why not wait and see what it looks like because as i mentioned in the intro we don't know what it looks like yet. We have an idea of what it could be. There's no guarantee that is what it's going to be like. So, you know, what do you think the metaverse will actually look like? How long will it take to get there? And is people spending money right now just kind of like trying to get PR basically to say, oh, look at us, we're hip, we're, we're trying to be part of this movement that's not ready for mainstream yet. First, we should lay the, the groundwork of, of what metaverse really kind of is. And it's 
in my view, a spectrum. A lot of people would agree with that it's a spectrum of your centralized metaverses that are your Minecraft, your Roblox, where they're controlling experiences of millions and millions of people, where you have these concerts taking place where millions are showing up with Travis Scott and Justin Bieber and all that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have these fully decentralized experiences that are empowering users to have ownership over not only the assets within the world, but also you know the, the world itself in many of these cases. So you have this full-blown spectrum from your centralized world that is you know, a powerhouse of getting these big name people in and doing these big experiences that are very much centralized and all that own ownership is by one big company. And then you have your decentralized owned by the players. So I'm more of a believer in the future being digital ownership within these worlds for the players. And there hasn't really been any innovation on that front in gaming for a decade you know, buying skins that are owned by the, the publisher doesn't count as ownership because I, they, I don't own them. You know, it's just me sinking money into the game, the game company. So I think that what we're watching now is a, is a shift over ownership in these worlds. So I think the metaverse itself is here uh, as it is today in all these different forms in between the spectrum that I was saying. So it, it, it's more of a, a question as to how how soon does the virtual world and ownership come together and work together soon uh, i think is the question and that is you know kind of the exciting part if if we knew exactly how this played out long term it, it wouldn't be fun there wouldn't be that big experiment there wouldn't be all these big players coming in and i think ultimately you need that unknown and i would venture to say that unless you know there was that unknown there wouldn't be a lot of people coming in taking swings doing huge bets and just kind of taking a shot at it so i agree with you virtual reality is is right around the corner probably sooner than this you know decentralized approach but the exciting thing is is these young entrepreneurs are coming in heavy and they're coming in with a lot of really great ideas and to add finally onto that I see this as breaking into a bunch of worlds here. There's going to be worlds for work. There's going to be worlds for commerce. There's going to be worlds for mental health. There's going to be worlds for gaming. There's going to be worlds for events and social events and things like that. And individual companies are going to try and have their own worlds. I think there's going to be all these different ways where you can communicate with each other and be in each other's presence that have never existed before. Um, and I, I, challenge a lot of people that are listening to this, maybe that are saying like, oh no, gaming's been around forever. This is just a game lobby. You never owned anything in those games. <laughs> so this is the shift to, to really think about as to what it looks like if you spend uh, 12 hours a day putting equity into an account on a game and you never before used to be able to withdraw that equity, you can now, which is a, a revolution in my opinion, of how this whole virtual world plays out. So you said something really interesting there, which was that people want to be able to own their assets and create equity within these metaverse instances. This brings me to two large contentions I have with the idea of a metaverse that a lot of people seem to hawk, but I think hasn't been thought through and may need another decade or more to be able to properly manage if ever at all that being the first one that will be able to like a ready player one move between worlds very smoothly now if you're creating a metaverse world and you're not using a single sign-on that every other brand is using you're gonna have to log out and log into this other application like i just i don't see how that's going to be done unless you have every company in the world agreeing to use a single sign-on method that obviously, you know, Metaverse or Meta was trying to create or, uh, you know, Microsoft might be trying to create. But, but I think that that's a goal for the Metaverse that may struggle to come to fruition. What do you think about that? The buzzword interoperability is one that people throw around a lot in the Web3 space. And the intention there is what you're describing of 
people will be able to fluidly move between these worlds. But ultimately, I think that this is going to be more of like apps on your phone. When you look at your phone, you don't have one login for all these different applications. You have a separate login for each one of these applications because each of those are private companies. You know, you're able to actually go in and and develop content in Instagram. You're able to go into TikTok and develop content there. And these are all siloed. And I think that this plays out the same way because that's what we know. The idea of being able to fluidly move between the two is great. And it's a, a beautiful concept. And there are cool innovations like Ready Player Me that are focusing on at the avatar level, being able to get you through all the different types of virtual worlds using like heavy, heavy tech in the background to kind of get a root of value from each world into the next one. But I think it plays out more so as these silos where you have individual logins, you're able to seamlessly log into each one of these, but separately. And I think brands are also playing this card as well, where they don't necessarily want their brand represented in certain worlds. They want it represented in a certain style. They want it either in like a hyper-realistic format or a playful one like Sandbox where it's voxelized. You know, there's, there's a lot of different things at play and everybody has a different style preference. So they're all going to be um, very different is how I kind of view it. So it's a great concept, but in practice, I think it's all going to be separate, separate logins, separate uh, styles, separate formats. And I was actually privy as a final note to that question to be in the first meeting uh, of the open metaverse um, alliance, which was basically in New York City, where I think it was about 15 of the CEOs in the metaverse. You had like Sandbox, Voxels, Decentraland, all of these people that what I was mentioning earlier for listeners on the end of the spectrum where they're actually giving ownership to the users through different types of technology, all those types of projects where they're trying to take a decentralized approach to virtual environments. They were in this room and there was talk about interoperability, what that looked like, what it looked like to buy an avatar in one of these worlds and move it into another one. And there were some big personalities there, a lot of uh, kind of fun, <laughs> fun banter and back and forth um, that took place there. And ultimately that did form, uh, I think it's called OMA3 now, the Open Metaverse Alliance and Web3 um, consortium where there's like a lot of really cool things that they're doing. But being in that meeting was very helpful into understanding how these platforms are thinking about it. And they want to keep it open. They, they want to be able to allow a kid in their, their garage to disrupt things that are going on in these different worlds. And I think that thinking is the right, what the right approach to something that could crack that nut that you're talking about, Sean, of like how, how these play nicely together is someone could come along and, and completely disrupt how we think about this. But for now, to answer the question, I think it's siloed. I'm glad that we agree because I think when a lot of the crypto bros were coming screaming earlier this year and last year about how the metaverse is going to be great and all this interoperability, I'm going, that just sounds like the ICO craze and the NFT craze and the DeFi craze. It's like, it's a pipe dream. I'm sorry, but it's just like, it's impossible. If you actually understand how code is created and you understand how capitalism works, the chance of interoperability between these worlds is highly unlikely due to the fact that data is super important. Companies want to keep data to themselves and they want to be able to have the right to sell that data. And if data is flowing between all of these different applications, it would require each of them to have integrations. It would have to be a single cloud-based user database. It's just beyond the realm of of sanity, I think, to be able to make that assumption that those things are going to happen. And and as you alluded to towards the end of your response to, to the last question I had, you had mentioned designs. And I, again, you know, I was going to ask, but you basically already answered it. It's incredible to think that you could also buy something in one game or one instance of the metaverse and carry it over to another application because you know, one one brand may use Unity, the other one might use Unreal. They're not going to pair well. One of them might use one design file 
type and the other uses a different design file type. How are you going to seamlessly transfer or translate or transcode that file? You know, what if the, you know, as you said, um, realistic versus, uh, versus cartoony, what if you buy something that's cartoony? Is it going to become hyper realistic in that next version? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. Maybe you would need, you know, uh, pointy from OpenAI to potentially help you to, to transcode these things. But like, it just sounds fantastical to a point that I don't think it's ever going to happen. There's a lot of, of people working on, at least on the protocol level, as to how interoperability works, where you actually move assets between different blockchains and stuff like that. So the decentralized infrastructure, it underneath all of it is, is where people are really trying to develop and, and move assets between the, the different chains. So I think that word being focused on the protocol level, and we're talking about what's being built on top where these, these virtual worlds are. So you got a couple different layers there. And I think that from the virtual world perspective and moving like dot GLB or dot VOX file formats across these different worlds, I think is, is going to be very, very, very difficult to do. And my take on this with Sandstorm is I think the builders themselves are the ticket. If Nike comes to Sandstorm and says, I need a shoe, a builder is going to be able to deploy that across five different virtual worlds, five different formats, and allow them to you know, tap into all of those communities, like all five of those different communities. And that is the, the approach that I think is how, if we, if we get to some world where people are locking arms and they're fluidly moving across each other in, in avatars, maybe that comes from the protocol level where assets sit and if, as long as they're built on the same blockchain, they can render in, in that, in that world. I don't know how it's going to play out, but I feel like the, the builders right now deploying across these different sort of siloed gardened, uh, worlds is how we get some semblance of one brand having a presence across multiple experiences and different views. Uh, that's kind of how I think one, one brand can get across all these different worlds and a player would need to get those different assets to go across those different worlds, which is another barrier to entry, more friction. And there's just so many different things that we run into with the, the barriers, like you were talking about before, where you have free to play games that are, you know, very, very important out there where people can buy things in the game, but you know, they don't own those items. I think, we're in a weird place now where people actually have to like pay to play in many of these situations where they have to have some dust in their wallet or they have to have some ETH in their wallet or Polygon or whatever it is. And I think that's a bigger problem as to like getting people in and getting people interested in the space because traditionally you could just kind of log on to a, um, you know, a, a browser game of some kind and, and, tinker around and play around. You didn't really need to buy anything or do anything. And I think that's the struggle right now, at least from what I'm seeing and hearing from a lot of the developers is just trying to figure out how to lower that barrier to allow more people to come in. Blockchain interoperability, right? You're talking about protocol level. The problem with that is there's thousands of blockchains and for interoperability, every blockchain would have to create interoperability with every other blockchain in order to make sure that every metaverse that's using any blockchain it wants has the ability to transfer those assets. On top of that, you mentioned that des you know designers can create the different file formats and spread them to the different metaverses. The problem with that is even if they do that, you know, I mean, I could be wrong, even if they do that, it doesn't mean that every metaverse world is going to accept their, their submission as an asset that can be visible or purchased in their world. And even then, how would the metaverse know that an asset is already owned by a user from another world? And then how, how would they deal with allowing it to be visible in this new world that they've moved to? And wouldn't they want to charge you a, a transference fee or something to enable you to be able to use this asset in this world? Right? So there, there's so many difficult steps, even in the protocol levels. And then, and on top of that, once you get, 
once you handle the technical difficulties, getting the companies themselves to tolerate this and, and to make it profitable for them, it just seems really difficult. Do you have any insight into how that could potentially be dealt with? There's a lot of different swings that have been taken at interoperability on the protocol level. One company in particular um, that I've been working with closely and know quite well is called Axelar. And I know that attempts previously with different bridging, meaning I want to send one ETH to uh, Avalanche or one of these different blockchains out there. The way that bridging worked traditionally, as far as I understand it, I'm not like programming on the protocol level daily here, but it would effectively lock up my, whatever I'm trying to transfer, it would lock it up into a smart contract and give me something that was wrapped on a different chain. And for everybody listening to this, um, th this is getting into the weeds as to how assets move from one network to one network in five years from now, this is all going to be in the background. Like this is just going to be something that operates in the background, just like a database. And for example, when I type in www.google, I don't know exactly all the different layers that are required in the back end, like HTTP to be pulling me to that website, showing me all these things. And you don't need to know that in five years what chain is being used in the background. And the goal here is in the back end to actually have it be fluid in some way. So what, what you're bringing up, Sean, is valid you know, uh, concerns about the complexities because it is hyper complex. Fortunately, there's brilliant people working on trying to figure out how, how these assets can either bridge or you know, be wrapped and move between these different chains because it, very similarly to the networks with the internet, we're, we're all trying to figure out how to get a better interface and the internet's done a good job. Web two, I don't need to know exactly how all of these things work as a consumer, but it should just be in the background. NFTs are going to be a thing that operates in the background. Blockchains operate in the background. I don't need to know if this site's ran on MongoDB. I just need to know that it runs. You know, I just need to use it, click a button and it uses it. So a lot of the things in every beginning of, a, of an industry, especially in the internet in the mid nineties, it was, it was all very abstract. You know, people were like, oh, why would I do that when I could listen to the radio? Why would I, why would I do that? And there was all these like really sort of, um, big issues that came up that they didn't have the solutions to, you know, they were like, okay, well, what really matters is that really interesting engineers come into this space over the next 20 years and build things, uh, that, that can help us develop. So I, I would say you're, you're partially right in terms of that you're, you're, uh, concerned interoperability could never come, but. I would say people in the beginning ages of the internet could never imagine that you and me would be talking via video recording on this really fancy all-inclusive app uh, this closely to when the internet launched. So just the, the rate of innovation is just insane with this technology as, as the internet and web two is kind of proven. So I would, I would challenge it and say that if this continues at our current rate, of innovation and people coming into a space and learning about it, tinkering and developing and figuring things out, it connects the dots. And uh, I think we're super early on, uh, as you pointed out, uh, that interoperability isn't solved yet. It's a billion dollar potential problem if people can figure it out and how to, how to figure it out. But there are a lot of big mistakes that have happened. Um, all you have to do is search on Google interoperability hacks, and you will see hacks of hundreds of millions of dollars where what I mentioned earlier with the wrap in the smart contract, hackers just attack that contract 24 seven all day because they say, okay, there's, there's hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in this one little honey pot. That's where everybody's, you know, locked assets to, to wrap them onto a different chain. I'm going to attack that. And it, and it became a real issue with a dozen or so projects of the last two years that have tried to take a home run swing at this 
uh, because it's such a, a huge potential outcome if you can solve it. But it, it, it results in some pretty explosive issues. Um, and you have to appreciate that level of, of risk and that level of um, you know, ambition to go after something that is so high risk. But I, uh, I think Axelar is a great example of some guys at the forefront, MIT guys, really brilliant in terms of how they're thinking about this. And there will be more. There will be more companies that are trying to come in and help in the background, uh, but for everybody here listening, um, it is something just like I said, that you don't have to necessarily be concerned about. It needs to be something that is for the engineers and developers to really focus on and you can learn about it, but, um, it is, it is going to operate in the background. I've been saying since 2016 that crypto wallets have a horrible interface. In 2022, I'm still saying they have a horrible interface. So if someone solves interoperability in a way that makes it something you never need to think about or talk about, I would argue that's a hundred trillion dollar problem or, or opportunity. Because by the time they fix it, the U.S. Federal Reserve... <laughs> will have printed so much money that we will be into the quintillions in the global economy. All jokes aside though, um, I have spoken to a number of people in the blockchain industry. And whenever I talk to someone, I always try to make the argument that blockchain isn't necessary for what you want to do. I would like you to create an argument for me about why the metaverse doesn't need blockchain or crypto or NFTs. Web one was read only where you just had static websites where you could just read things. Web two was where you could contribute, publish, upload content to these Goliath companies like Google and YouTube and stuff like that. And web three being, I actually own the things that I create in this environment. So I would say that we can definitely continue with web two and the, uh, Googles of the world can continue to, to vacuum up us as products and our data and everything like that. And it could work like, it, and it has worked with Minecraft and Roblox and these companies where they run smoothly. You know, there's not some sort of DAO where there's a bunch of drama all the time, <laughs> people like clawing at each other all day, every day to, to get a decision done. And, there's none of that. Um, and there's decision-making happening. Like there's, there's a hierarchy, there's all these things that have proven to work. So I would say that the point to offset the need for blockchain as a whole for the metaverse would be if we want to continue business as usual, we can do that. We can totally offer up our data as the purchase price, get into these worlds. They can run smoothly. Uh, to a certain extent, and we can, of course, continue business as usual. Now, if we want to move forward into a digital world where uh, AI replaces everybody doing anything redundant and creatives are the ones that can actually survive uh, a disruption like that, I think we should own it. I think we should be able to own whatever we create. Um, I think that when we upload this podcast, it is giving that to a publisher. Um, and I think that there is a, a really controversial piece over ownership that's taking place right now. And for perspective on what we were talking about before with, you know, your comments around the user interface. So with adoption, and that's like a buzzword in, in the web three slash crypto space in 1999, 2000 ish, there are about 250, 300 million people using the internet. That was like the, the real explosion that happened in, in 2000 and in 1995, I think there were like 15, 16 million people. And to give everybody context, you have roughly between what's estimated 200 to 300 million people have participated in crypto. They have a crypto wallet of some kind 
and they've, they've tinkered with it. So if you just overlay those two into very, you know, sort of disruptive networks that have happened to us as a, a species, you have 2000, we'll call it the 1999 internet is where we're at in terms of the phase of web three. And if you fast forward to let's call it 10 years from now, I think that we're going to be looking at a totally unique interface uh, of something that we, we don't really know what it's going to look like, but, um, I would wager that people are going to get tired of being the product. They're going to be tired of throwing out. Uh, I've, I've heard this analogy used. They, they literally throw the, the baby out, uh, and the crib and the bath and the bath water. When it comes to signing up for a website, you're like, here, take everything from me in terms of data <laughs> and use it like everything. And you click the box and say, I accept, and it needs to be a agreement of some kind where I say, Hey, you can have this, but you can't have this. And I need to know what that is in a really easy interface and a really easy to use transaction takes place. When I click that button that says, yes, you can have my age and where I live and that, but you know, you can't actually have like my purchase history from credit cards that you're buying as I sign up and cross-referencing it. Like there, there are certain things that you got to draw the line on. And I think people are getting smart when it comes to lit, to this, especially with the level of, of content being produced. And as people realize like, actually I need to own the rights to this and I need royalties for this instead of cents on the dollar, I want to make a couple of dollars or I want to make a full dollar. And there is a world where that exists. How far along that is, that could be 10 years, that could be 20 years. But if anything has proven itself as much as the internet has, things happen faster uh, than we expect. And coming 22 years later, after 300 million people uh, are in the internet, I mean, how many, how many are in it today? I think it's uh, is it 6 billion? I forgot. I forgot what the number is, um, but it's, it's in the, in the high billions. So we're, we're still early. Uh, and I know that that's like a, a phrase that people say a lot, but I would, I would just encourage everyone to know business as usual doesn't last, um, long when people kind of want to own what they're doing in a digital world. Right. Maybe the metaverse does need something that kind of takes away some level of control from companies and, and hands it to the user. But why does that need to be blockchain? Because blockchain in its current uh, like version isn't really good. There's a lot of problems. Notably, uh, you know, the fact that the transactions per second isn't really good. So if you want to have potentially 100 million people on an application in the metaverse at one time, you need to have an amazing blockchain. Now, the, from with, with that in mind, wouldn't it make sense to build something better than a blockchain and have that be the thing that powers the metaverse? I think that a hybrid of the two makes perfect sense to get us to a place where... Uh... You know, there's a, there's a spectrum of these worlds where if I want to go to a place where I can own a hundred percent of what I'm doing, that's great, but it's going to move slower. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be a much slower experience for now. If there's a front end, that's like a web two interface that allows speed and everything that we currently have with web two, and then the back end allows for actual ownership because there's nothing else out there as far as I'm concerned that allows you for verifiable ownership in terms of things that I truly custody myself that no one can, no one can come and, and get my, my private keys. Like I, I, I think that there's the argument there is what other technology could be verifiable through ownership, uh, that is self custodied. And I, I'm not aware of anything unless you are of, of, of how that would work in terms of like a verifiable piece of ownership. In fact, there are some blockchains that don't actually have blocks and we call them blockchains because we don't know what to call them and you'll find them on crypto market cap and and coin market cap uh, but they don't use blocks and i think 
even though they were created years ago, there's probably something that could be done to make it better. It's possible that with the help of something like, uh, you know, chat GPT or some further instance of it, we might be able to use AI to make something better than a blockchain in a very quick period of time that could outshine it. Maybe it would require artificial intelligence to work with quantum computers in order to create something that's better, right? A quantum uh, system to power the metaverse. And, and probably that will be the second version of a metaverse. Uh, you know, something that you, someone that uses a quantum computer that has an AI coding its structure. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's 20 years, 30 years from now. But um, I don't know. I love to dream. Totally. And I, I'd love to dream, too. I, I think it 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 can be a, a, a hybrid of the two. I, I think we're we're in a space now where it's so much experimentation. I mean, these billion dollar experiments are, you know, going imploding left, you know, all over the place. I think it's, it's very important to know we're in an experimental stage where 90 plus percent of these blockchains fail. There are going to be leaders that do cool experimental things like you're talking about with different lattice structures and DPOS of allowing people to uh, you know, govern the chain and things like that. I, I think there's a lot of cool experimentation that's going on. And I would say that if settlement of these different in-game assets happened at a later time, you don't really need a high throughput of transactions per second. You know, if, if I'm going around playing my game, whether it's Fortnite or Minecraft or Roblox, and then I look at my dashboard and say like, okay, uh, settle up and everything is pulled down to the blockchain level that says, yep, I can verify that you own this, 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 and this, you have your private key. So you therefore own those items. And it's just, you know, on, on the dashboard level. So I, I can see that items are, are there. I can see that I own them and maybe I can opt into playing with certain items and transacting when I go, go through and, uh, you know, play different games and things like that. But there's, there's a lot of different moving parts to the virtual environment and you're really into VR. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's cool to be able to talk to you about this because if I'm in a virtual environment, um, I think that all the assets that have been created, the unique user generated content that's been created around me. If I want to purchase something or I want to transact in any way, the people who created that need to be able to get rewarded for that. If it's not an overlord structure of like an Epic games that owns it, if there's a hundred different creators that have made a beautiful experience that I'm in and I want to buy a couple of these items, they should be able to get that payment. Uh, and if it's in a, a truly sort of uh, mixed hybrid web two, web three metaverse, it's possible sooner than I think we 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 expect um, where I could buy something and three creators get royalties when I do that one transaction. And that's the only settlement that takes place. And there's not really much TPS that needs to you know be required unless millions of players are transacting all at the same time. And maybe that happens down in the future and there's like sharding and all sorts of fancy things that are going on in the background. But uh, for now, I think just getting people comfortable with that self custody and with that ownership can be done on a, on a smaller scale and kind of usher people into just that, that slight little tweak over ownership of, of overlord versus the user. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to add? I mentioned that we were early and that the technology is going to move into the background. And there are these very, very speculative um, booms and busts that happen, these cycles that come through where everybody with a project is coming out and saying like, hey, check this out. We have a million transactions per second. We're the, the future and people go in and they buy into it. And it's a speculative uh, rush up and then rush down. And this just happens time and time again with all different types of technology. And I would just encourage everybody out there to, you don't have to buy anything. You don't have to uh, you know go and invest. Not everybody should just be a, a day trader or anything like that. When you 
when you experiment around and when you look at different things, just try to read white papers and read what these people are building and just try to think through some of the logic that they're bringing to this tech. Because somebody listening to this show could completely change how you and I just walked through all this, Sean. I mean, it, it, I like to always be very open with that it's experimental and that people are tinkering, they're playing around, they're taking shots, they're taking risks. And I think you as the the builders and the listeners and the consumers and the players and the creators and everybody have a role, which is just try to try to break things, try to go in and, and play around and and experiment and have fun with it because there's not many windows in a lifetime when you get to to challenge these centralized sort of authorities and moving to decentralization is something that is very, very, uh, a big undertaking. So it takes a lot of people to learn about it and to get involved and to play around with it. So I just wanted to add that little motivational note <laughs> in, in that you, you don't have to buy a bunch of stuff. You can just learn about it and, and really like learning about it to, to get involved. And how can people follow up at the Steve McGarry on Twitter and uh, at Sandstorm Meetup or Sandstorm.co is our website. And, you know, there's people that the best builders are making $20,000 a month. There's some builders that are making, uh, you know, a few hundred dollars. But ultimately, there is the ability to learn how to create assets in five different virtual worlds um, and list them on your profile and connect with brands, all sorts of different brands, everybody from like Tupac Shakur's estate to gaming companies and all these different cool, cool brands that want to come in and dip their toe in. So sandstorm.co is a great place to, to check out more and Twitter. We're always on there chatting and making memes and stuff like that. So come check us out. Thank you for that. The links that you shared will be in the show notes available, uh, where the episode descriptions are. So thank you very much for your time and your energy, Steve. I appreciate it. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. And the metaverse is not even a marathon. It's like a million marathons put together uh, because of just how many years it's going to take to really make this thing something that people will use uh, on a daily basis. So I wish you luck on your journey and I uh, look forward to seeing what Sandstorm comes up with in the future and, and how it adds to the conversation. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Sean.